I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Hello, my name is JKD. I discovered your channel a few days ago and found it extremely interesting. I'd like to share my experience. I grew up in San Diego, California. My parents were originally from Sicily, Italy. Growing up, I was always an outdoors person, whether it was dirt bikes, hiking, hunting, or fishing. I knew all too well about being in the wilderness. When I turned 15, my Nona, grandma in Italian, who had been living in Sicily, decided to move to the West Coast. She'd become wealthy in her lifetime and wanted to buy a large property and live the rest of her days in peace and quiet of the mountains. After a few weeks of looking, she purchased a 150-plus acre property. Soon after moving in, she called for the construction of a new home, power systems, internet, water systems, and roads, which is quite a lot for an 85-year-old woman. The wildlife was abundant, especially the mule deer all over the property. I got my tag as soon as I possibly could, and I got a 6.8 Winchester for Christmas that year. One cold morning, I awoke in the house to the sun still set. I got dressed and loaded my pack and rifle with Winchester Big Game Long Range 165 grain rounds. I started walking to my blind that sat on the edge of a tree line looking into a meadow. The walk was about 20 minutes. About seven or so minutes through the walk, I thought I heard heavy footsteps to my right in the thick brush. They were matching my speed and stride. I thought nothing of it since I didn't have my espresso that morning. When I was about 200 yards from the blind, I heard what sounded like a baby muttering and whining for something, but it didn't sound like a human baby. It had more of a high-pitched monkey kind of tone. Once again, I ignored it as it only went on for a few seconds. When I reached the blind, I unzipped the flap and entered to put my pack down and set up my rifle tripod. There was a little bit of fog, so I waited until it lifted. At about 8.30 a.m., I spotted three does moving from the adjacent tree line into the meadow. I figured there would be a buck still hanging back in the brush, so I waited to see if he would show himself. The does seemed a bit on edge because they kept their heads up and pointed their ears to a certain spot to the left of my blind. I looked to where the deer were looking. There was a fallen pine tree with another smaller tree leaning on it and a large dark shape close to the ground near it. It was about 70 yards away, so I lifted my rifle and put the dark shape into my optic. What I saw was a large, bulky, monkey gorilla thing lying on its stomach adjacent to the pine trees that had fallen onto the ground. Attached to the creature's back was what I believed to be its young child. It looked like the larger creature was a male considering the size and back muscles. I guess it was teaching the younger one how to stalk. They were both covered in dark brown, thin, and shiny hair. It then went to a crouching position and slowly inched closer to the edge of the trees. At this point, I was frozen with fear. My brain decided to break my trance, and I got up and ripped the blind door open with my rifle in my hands and started walking toward the creature yelling to let it know I was there. The creature's back was mostly facing me. I thought he was going to have to turn his whole body to look in my direction. Instead, it turned its neck about 180 degrees like an owl would. The young one on its back let go and darted under a pine tree that was on the ground. It then stood up. It seemed to be more than six foot eight compared to me who is six foot one. It looked at me with a look of surprise and confusion. I then yelled at it to get out of here and I made a scuff like a tiger. It bent down, grabbed its young and then took off running but in a stride I've never seen before. It would leap one foot at a time but would cover six feet of ground with each step or leap. It was gone in under five seconds. I could hear it crashing through the brush in front of me. I never ran home so fast in my life. No one knows about what I saw until now, if you put this into a video. I'm now 17, and since then, I've moved to the Midwest. J.K.D. I never thought much about Bigfoot, although I had seen a few documentaries and a couple of episodes of that reality show where they went looking for him. It wasn't that I didn't believe, but I just wasn't a believer, you know? Well, all of that changed for me back in 2012. I was out on the back deck of my house, tending to the smoker that I had started earlier that morning. My wife's parents were coming for dinner that night, so I had a pork shoulder and two racks of ribs going. 
Now, me and my father-in-law have a good-natured rivalry about the whole grilling and smoking thing about who does it better. So yes, I did. I hovered over that smoker on and off through the day, and I was adding wood chips when needed, adjusting the vents, checking the meat obsessively every hour or so. I had to show the old man up, you know. It was a nice day for mid-October. It was sunny and, well, not warm. It was balmy in the late 60s. I was sitting at the outdoor table with my back against the house, reading on my Kindle to pass the time. The smoker sat along the deck railing opposite from me, but just a little to the right of where I was sitting, giving me a clear view across the flat, grassy area of our property and beyond to where the land began a gradual incline up a wooded slope, which was also part of our land, I should add. Now, we've lived here for a little over 17 years, so I knew the view from that deck during all four seasons very well whether it was light green with the new leaves coming out in the spring and what it looked like with the dark green canopy throughout the summer or the amazing autumn colors or the white blanket snow of winter. I know how that slope looked and I could almost draw a map from memory of where every tree stood in the main view from the deck. But that year, there just hadn't been much of a display of color. Instead, it seemed that the leaves have skipped the whole autumn thing and instead turned brown and curled up almost overnight and by that day, only a few lone clumps of leaves still clung to any of the trees on the hillside, giving me a rare, clear view straight through the skeletons of the bare tree trunks all the way to the top of the slope and the nothingness of the sky beyond it. Now, I had probably raised my gaze to look over at that smoker and back down to my Kindle dozens of times as I had been sitting there all day. But this time, something was different. My eyes came to a halt halfway between the smoker and my Kindle. There was a large, dark lump out on the slope. I looked at it, and it was not the flat top angle of a tree stump, and it was wider than any tree stump that was out there. It was also a lot darker, whereas the trees themselves appeared more of a weathered mid-brown color. This was much darker, and looked a hair away from black to me from that distance. It stuck out on the hillside. I watched the dark lump for a moment, trying to reason out what it was. After a few minutes, it hadn't moved, so I didn't think it was an animal. And while there had been issues with people illegally dumping things, this was mostly along the rural road out front, or maybe the back edge of our property beyond that hill. I was still looking at that dark lump when my wife popped out on the deck to check on me and see if I needed anything. I pointed out the dark lump to her, and she had no idea what it might be either. We talked for a few minutes about other things, and she went back inside but I kept checking that dark lump on the hillside. It still hadn't moved. So I told myself it was nothing, and it's probably just something I've never noticed in the millions of times as I looked out there, and I went back to my reading. But my mind wouldn't let it go. I kept raising my gaze to look out onto the hillside, each time my eyes searching out for that dark shape. There was something about it that was really bothering me. Another half hour or more of my mind wandering away from my reading to think about the dark lump. In exasperation, I put my Kindle down and decided that if I didn't go prove to my brain that it was nothing more than a big tree stump or some clump of debris, my mind was not going to shut up about it. I got up and walked across the yard, keeping my eyes on the dark lump. I remember my brain was going through a process of throwing out ideas one after another of what it might be and almost simultaneously, my brain was immediately shooting them down. I was thinking things like, maybe it was an injured bear. And then my brain would say, no, an injured bear would be more likely to be spread out and lying down. It wouldn't be so vertical and rounded looking. Or maybe it would say, hey, maybe it was a tree that just freshly fell. And then it would round off with, but no, there weren't any trees that big in circumference, and if there had been, it would have taken a lot to break it off at that height and leave a massive stump that size. And besides, hey, did you notice there's no fallen tree on the ground anywhere near it? So that's how my thoughts went as I walked across the yard, one side of my brain throwing out possibilities, while the other side was knocking them down as fast as I could toss them out. Now, my mind was still doing its weird idea tossing and batting cage thing as I reached the edge of where the mowed area of our land stopped and the incline of the wooded slope started. And about 60 feet or so away from me was the dark lump. I was walking right to the edge and the dark lump suddenly stood upright. I stopped dead in my tracks. My eyes must have been wide because, again, my mind was tossing out ideas about what the heck I was seeing 
and the other half was immediately shooting them down. Nothing fit. It was saying things like, well, maybe that was a hunter in a ghillie suit that was trespassing on my land, and that meant I could be in a very dangerous situation. But even from 60 feet away on a slope, I instantly knew that no human is that tall or that large. And for a hunter trespassing, why would he sit there for a better part of an hour watching me? Also, my brain realized I didn't see a gun. Furthermore, my brain threw out the logic that a ghillie suit for fall hunting isn't likely to be a color just on the brown side of black that stands out against the autumn landscape as starkly as it had to me as I sat all the way on my back deck. A hundred thoughts came and went in my mind in the space of that second and a half, and I looked at the creature before it turned and walked up over the slope and out of my sight. I stood there, my jaw wide, watching the powerful and fast walk up the slope, and my mind just went blank trying to think of a creature that could do such a thing so fluidly and quickly. It was completely effortless as it glided to the top of the slope. I probably stood there for a full five seconds or more after it passed out of my sight. I was unsettled and maybe a bit in shock. I turned to the deck, the feeling of unease growing. When my wife came out on the deck a few minutes later, I told her what had just happened. I didn't make the connection that it could have been a Bigfoot, but she did. And then she told me that her parents had seen a Bigfoot many years ago. Now this surprised me because in all these years, I've never heard that story from either my wife or my in-laws. But then I thought about it. How likely was I to tell anyone what I seen today? I told my wife I'd like to keep this just between us, and I thought that would be the end of it. But still, I kept looking at the slope across the way for the rest of the afternoon. When my in-laws arrived for dinner that evening, we sat down to dinner and against my wishes, my wife soon began telling her parents about what I had seen that afternoon. Now, I was expecting ridicule from my in-laws, but instead, they told me all about their own encounter from back in the early 70s. At the time, my mother-in-law was pregnant with my wife's younger brother, and my wife was then two years old. My mother-in-law said she was hanging laundry outside and had put Kim and Peaches, their tiny chihuahua, together in a playpen under a tree about 15 feet from where she was hanging the laundry on the line. It was close enough that she could talk to Kim and keep her from running off while she wasn't looking. Now, Kim was babbling nonstop, as two-year-olds often do, and my mother-in-law says she remembers talking back to Kim in that same conversation style that adults do with little children that are talking nonsense when suddenly Peaches began howling and yipping, as if in great distress or pain. Now, this alarmed my mother-in-law because it was very different from anything she had ever heard from her dog in the six years that they had had her. She quickly stepped around the hanging laundry so the playpen under the tree was in full view. She then saw Kim was still babbling, but wasn't looking at her, but rather in the opposite direction from her on the clothesline. My mother-in-law followed Kim's gaze and saw a large hulking creature standing next to the closest tree from where the playpen stood, maybe 20 or 25 feet away. My mother-in-law said that she could see the creature seem to be focused solely on Kim. My mother-in-law started screaming and running toward the playpen and said as soon as she began yelling, the creature turned and ran further back into the trees. Now, as soon as they had enough money, my in-laws moved the following spring and according to my mother-in-law, after that day, hung laundry outside the house, unless my father-in-law was home and outside with her. She also never took Kim or Peaches out to the backyard ever again. My father-in-law said he also had a sighting years after that, but like me, it was at a distance and brief. No, my wife has no memory of her encounter as a child, but she does believe her mother's version of it. And, you know, after knowing my in-laws for almost 20 years, I do too. Now the next day, my father-in-law came back over and together we walked the hillside, but we didn't find anything. But as neither of us are trained trackers or hunters, there's a possibility we could have missed something. You know, since that day, we've all talked it over and we wonder, maybe it was the smell of the smoked pork that caught the creature's attention. Or maybe it was just curious about what I was doing there on the deck. None of us seem to know. Oddly, I didn't feel threatened by it, and as long as it's peaceful, Kim and I have decided it's welcome on our land. Through all the seasons, I've kept looking for it, but I've never seen it again. 
I live in Wairika, California with my husband and 12-year-old daughter. My husband works for a construction company and sometimes has to spend a week or two awake from home. This June, while he was away, I decided to take a road trip with my daughter, Abigail, and visit some friends who live in Southern Oregon. We followed the I-5 north to Ashland and spent a week with my college pals. From there, we went to Grants Pass to take one of the Hellgate boat trips and explore the antique store on 6th Street. The next morning, we followed the Redwood Highway to Cave Junction to spend another week with my oldest and dearest friend, Betty. When it was time to return home, I decided to take the back roads through Happy Camp and on to Wairika. It takes an hour or so longer, but it's a lovely drive. I knew my husband wouldn't like us traveling the lowly distance by ourselves, so I didn't tell him when I called him to let him know we were getting ready to come home. After a leisurely breakfast, we said our goodbyes to Betty and her family and took Rocky Dale to Waldo Road and soon turned into Happy Camp Road. It was a bit confusing here because the Happy Camp Road is also called Grayback Road and Indian Creek Road. I guess I drank too much coffee that afternoon because after only 30 minutes, I desperately needed a bathroom break. Thank goodness the Page Mountain Snow Park was only a few miles further, where I knew there were restrooms in the parking area. I went to use the facilities and told Abigail to stay inside the car with the doors locked. There was no one around and we hadn't passed another vehicle, but you never know what can happen in these wild mountains. When I came back out, she had gotten out of the car and was reading the signboard that tells about the state of Jefferson. As I was standing there scolding her, we heard something that sounded like pounding out in the nearby woods. At first, it sounded very near the parking lot, and then there was a sound of more pounding from further away. We turned to see what was making the noise, and there was a very large animal standing on its hind legs. It had a piece of dead tree in its front paws and was getting ready to hit it against the enormous pine it was standing near. Abigail yelled, Bear, and we both ran to the car and jumped in. From the relative safety of the car, we continued to watch the bear. But it wasn't a bear. This animal was standing straight, not hunched over at all. Its fur was a sort of cinnamon color and was much longer than a bear's coat. Its face didn't seem to have much hair on it, and nor did its hands. Abigail and I shouted at the same time, That's a Bigfoot. We were too far away from it to make eye contact, and we didn't feel it was threatening us in any manner but we didn't want to take any chances and wanted to be on our way. When we arrived home, Steve was there, and I had to come clean about the route we took home. He stood there and looked at me for a few minutes and told me not to ever do that again. Abigail and I recounted our story at the dinner table that night, and then Steve and I both encouraged her not to share this story with her friends. She agreed, but who knows what will happen when she returns to school in the fall. Maxine Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.